Right, hello everyone, welcome back to series number two of 30 Minutes With. Today I am joined by a man whose uh, frog dance celebration on the Craven Cottage pitch will always be iconic in FA Cup history. It is, of course, Barrow AFC manager Pete Wilde. Welcome to the show, Pete. How do we find you this morning? Very good, mate. Yeah, I'm very good. Not like the weather, but I'm, I'm, I'm all right. Thanks, pal. And thanks for having me on. Yeah, you're more than welcome. Uh, I should just say before we get started that this podcast is partnered with The Big Step. Uh, there is an excessive amount of gambling advertising in football and The Big Step do great work highlighting the damage and danger it does to people's lives. You can follow them at the underscore Big Step on Twitter and see the great work they do for yourselves. Right, Pete, so uh, you're at Barrow. You've, you've got that appointment. Firstly, congratulations on that. Um, I saw your your sort of interview with them and they mentioned oh I think you you mentioned that you, know, you were unsure whether all the Barrow fans would have heard of you I think you do yourself a massive disservice there because um for us who have been watching these things carefully I I honestly think we were expecting you to get back in the EFL maybe and no no disrespect to Barrow at a bigger club because of the work you were doing at Halifax um what what do you so sort of now you've had a chance to the dust itself. What do you make of your your time at Halifax and how you did there? Well, uh, I think to answer your question, I, I was very lucky across all the three years of being at Halifax that there was interest and things I thought may happen. But uh, but I, I I think Halifax was massive for me. I think it it allowed me to learn my trade. It allowed me to go to an environment with, with an owner that um, allowed me to do uh, to make mistakes. Helped me along the way, uh, teach me right from wrong and and, and, al and allow me to try and develop and hone in my skills. So I think Halifax was a massive part of my career and, and allowed me to, to to fail in inverting commas or succeed in inverting commas uh, by doing things my way. Um, so I'll always be indebted to Halifax for, for how they treated me and, and how my career developed there. Um, and I think it's put me in I'm a better person coming back into the football league now uh, than I certainly was when I when I came out of it with Oldham. Yeah, I think uh, I think uh, another certain manager who went on to have a career at Oxford United and then uh, in the Premier League with Sheffield United, Chris Wilder. Um, he certainly would say Halifax was um, a great starting point for his career. Uh, we expect big things from you as well, Pete. So no excuses. You've got a uh, no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure at all. Um, one thing I will get out of the way first, obviously you're an Oldham fan, you started your career at Oldham. Uh, sadly, we saw them uh, fall into the National League at the end of the season. Were you surprised about that, given what you knew about the club during your time there? That's a tough question to ask. Was a surprise that, that there was a, a downfall, a de demise over a period of time or a period of years, and it was getting more and more nerve-wracking by the year. Would they stay in the Football League? I, I covered a game for, for the local radio back in March and they beat Leighton Orient 2-0 and I thought, well, that's it now, they'll stay up. They were they were brilliant on the night. They were far better than Orient on the night. And I thought, they've got more than enough in the dressing room there to stay up. And I came away pretty hopeful, pretty chipper, thinking they'll stay up. But unfortunately, it wasn't to be. Um, these things happen. I think they'll come back a bigger, stronger club. You, you look at Orient, Grimsby, etc., for example, who've had takeovers when they've gone into the National League and and come back bigger, stronger clubs. You look at Chesterfield having had a takeover now and look a bigger, stronger club for that. So I think, yes, in the short term, it's devastating. It's demoralising for not just for the football club, for the town. But I am I'm truly hopeful that they'll come back bigger, stronger, better with, with a, a better structure uh, on and off the pitch. Absolutely. Let's hope so. Um, things happening behind the scenes as we... Uh... As we record this, hopefully things will soon come to light, and the uh, and the takeover that's been muted will get over the line, and and things can start going in the in the right direction. The big thing, of course, there is they you reunite the uh, the stadium with the club, and uh, a lot of clubs have found themselves in a difficult situation when that split has happened. Um, it really is quite difficult to move forward uh, with with out owning your own ground and having real tangible assets to draw income from. So let's hope that happens. Barrow, uh, since coming back into the Football League, have struggled. It's to, it's honest and uh, fair to say that. You know, last season, uh, there were a few squeaky bums uh, up in Cumbria as they got a bit close to the relegation zone at one point themselves. You coming in there, what is your 
your thought process and how you go about making sure that this club now takes a step forward where they are looking up rather than over their shoulder? I think Barrow spent the last couple of years trying to come to terms with Football League on and off the pitch, the structure behind the scenes, etc. And I think they've had a couple of false dawns. But I really think now with the structure that they put behind the club, that they are ready. They are ready to, to, to really push on. And what really excited me about the, the role and the job was that it could be anything. It really has the potential to be anything, this football club. And and there's not really a lot to follow from. So I can really go in and, and put my own stamp on things and really try and hopefully build the football club on and off the pitch. I I class Barrow as a similar town to Oldham in terms of its its makeup of people and being a working class town. So I think I can relate to the people quite well. We had a, a Q&A on Friday night with the the owners and they were um, and with the with the fans, and I really got a sense of sort of feeling a belonging of what the foot everybody at the football club wants the club to do well. They want to drive in the, that same direction, and that really excites me because I think it, it has the potential to to really establish itself in League Two and, and from there on push on and and be whatever it can be. Um, I also be, also believe that. This the causes of its location. We can really create this atmosphere in home games of what everybody coming to Barrow and thinking, "Oh my God, we got Barrow away," and, and really playing on that mentality. So there's loads of things that attracted me. They've got some really good people working in the football club. It actually, when I went there the first day, reminded me of what Oldham used to be when I, all them years I worked at Oldham. Real family club, really. Uh, everybody in it for the right reasons. The town fully behind the football club, and for all them reasons, it just it's really exciting. So that's why it's really, really. That's good to hear. It's nice to sort of see those clubs maintain that very strong link to their community, and good to see that you are out there doing a Q and A and and being accessible. One thing I would say. Uh, League Two is a tough division. We've seen it the last couple of years how uh, how many points you need to get into the playoffs. And this year, I have a feeling will be quite a similar uh, sort of sort of target. You might need a few more points to stay up as well this year. So, uh, something for everyone to bear in mind. One thing I would say as well is managers tend to come in and talk about their philosophies. And I often think in League Two that's a little bit luxurious and a, and can be a bit dangerous. I mean, how do you see it? Are you quite pragmatic, or do you have a, a very clear idea of the identity you want to bring to Barrow? I'm very pragmatic as a person. Um, don't brand yourself too much on the way in. Um, see what you've got in the building. We have a, queer, a clear model of how we want to do things. Um, that helps us recruit. But first and foremost, we need to be industrious. We need to work hard. We need to be tough to play against. We need to be hard to beat. We need to have lots of energy about us. And then we can build on our in possession of how we'd like to, the game to be played and how we want to play. But it's a very pragmatic approach that, that is based on hard work and, and making sure that we win the ball back at the first opportunity. And we're a reflection of the people and the reflection of the town. They pay 20 quid every week to come and watch the team play. We need to give them some honesty and some hard work that they can walk out that door and think, all right, the result may be not going our, our way today, but we've worked as hard as we can and they've got, they've got the money's worth. And so, yes, we have a philosophy, but it, it's more of a game model and it's based on hard work and dedication and determination to make sure that we're tough to play against and, and then when we've been tough to play against, we're good on the air. Well, your Halifax side, notoriously difficult to score against, excellent defensive record. I'm assuming that's something you'll you'll first and foremost try and bring uh, to, to Barrow. Um, but you look at this division, uh, it's, it's not that dissimilar to the, uh, the National League. You have got some massive hitters. Uh, you had a, a sort of bottom quarter budget with Halifax in, in the division below. I would imagine Barrow would be something fairly similar. So... How, how do you approach getting the most out of your squad when perhaps financially you're going to be behind some of the big hitters in the division? Well, yeah, like you say, I don't think there's much between League Two and the National League. Generally, teams who come out of the, of the National League generally do well in League Two. So I don't think there's much in the, in the divisions. I think it's just the fifth division now, the National League. Mostly everybody's full-time now. So, um, But like you say, the big hitters, well, they all spend this money. Uh, there'll be seven or eight big hitters in League Two. By definition, at least four of them will get it wrong because that's just that's just how it is. 
And when they get it wrong, we've got to be ready to pounce. And we've got to be ready there. We've got to be well organised. We've got to have a team of people that are honest individuals. And what we try to assemble in our squad is a set of honest individuals that will work as hard as they can, will be as organised as they can. So when we do come up against the so-called better, bigger teams, that we can give them a run for our money. I, I'm no doubt I've not come in here to be little old Barrow that's fine at the bottom of the league. I've come here to come and turn heads and, and bring in people that want to turn heads and, and want to, to take it to the big boys. They're not just going to come in and just make up the numbers. I've got no interest in that. I've come in here to, to give a real good account of ourselves and some turn some heads while we do it. I'm sure you I'm sure you will do that, to be honest. I think I think a club like Barrow, when you looked at them last season, it was always quite fine margins when they weren't winning. Um, it was more a case of them not being able to take advantage of moments in matches where they were on top. You know, those, those people talk about the cliche of it's a game in both boxes, but actually, you know, it is. It's football. You know, you've got to score to win football matches. And as good as a defensive record you may have, that's not going to get you three points. You need to be able to take advantage at the other end. Talking about that, how how do you assess this squad as an attacking force? Because they were at times last season uh, struggling to make an impact at the top end of the pitch. Yeah, I think you look at the stats last year. They had fourteen clean sheets, um, so that's 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 quite good. That's quite good mm. for a team. So we looked at the squad. What we thought that we had was a lot of good footballers. There's some really good footballers in the building, but what we wanted to try and put around them was some industrious. Us. Uh, we, we, we needed some people that could could match it when when things when your backs were against the wall. So we brought some lads in who we thought could do that. We brought some experience in because we thought the group was quite young and, and we needed to, uh, some experience in the building. And we've hopefully brought some goals in the building. We brought Billy Waters in twenty goal season. Richie Bennett, who's a proven striker at this level, um, and and we, we are going to try and play a lot more football in their half and and try and like I say win the ball back at the earliest opportunity, which gets us in their half, which gives us more chance of scoring goals in their half and not start defending till around the halfway line in our own half and then have 50, 60 yards to try and get towards goals to try and score. So we're going to try and take it to the teams and try and win the ball back higher, which gives us more opportunities and more chances to get in their box. We played Ashton United last night. We must have had 10 fantastic opportunities and we're going to score one goal. That was off a set piece. Mm. But what I'm trying to say is that we're winning the ball back higher up the pitch now and Hopefully that will lead to more chances. Yeah, let's hope so. And uh, talking about recruitment, um, you've, I think, brought in seven uh, new faces already. Um, you know, some key players from last season have gone and I'm, I'm sure that's sort of balancing the ins and outs as you would see fit. But talk us about your, your firstly, the, the recruits you have brought in and what you hope from them. And is there anyone in there that you think fans will really enjoy, will probably excite them? Uh, but secondly... Your, your thoughts around recruitment generally and your philosophy you'll bring to Barrow about how you go about recruitment? Well, I, because we have a clear way of playing, it makes recruitment easier because you know what type of player you're looking for and, and, and how you're going to play. We're not a team that just goes, he's a decent player, let's get him in. We know exactly what we're going after. Um, so we've tried to re recruit on, on three levels. Number one, on, on sort of young, hungry lads on the way up. So desperate to do well, maybe have done well in National League or are doing well in the U23s at their football club. So some young, hungry lads on the way up. We've tried to bring in a couple of lads who know the level, know what it takes to play at this level and, and know what a 46-game season looks like and the bumps in the road that come along the way with a 46-game season. And we've recruited a, a couple of really experienced League 2 players who, who will give us that experience. And not only just League 2 players, the players who've won this league and got out of this league and know what it takes to be at the top end of this league. So we've tried to recruit a couple of them as well. So we think we've got a really good mix in the, in the dressing room of, of them types of players. Uh, but that's all based on on our model. Number one in our recruitment is, is he a good lad? If he's a good lad, we'll get, a, we'll get more out of him. And number two, is he a good player? So number two is always, is he a good player? Number one is always a good lad. And is he a good lad in our recruitment? That's the, that's done me well in the past that that's stood me, stood me in good stead in the past and and hopefully that'll do the same we've got seven in the building like a couple more and then that'll take us up to 22 two for every position and then go and fight it out and then we'll have three members of the squad that are the young potentials that were maybe need a little bit of work and uh, and we'll work with them on them, them three to make sure we make them better and 
and make them football or financial assets for the football club. Yeah, that was my next question, actually. You, you've come from a, um, a youth coaching background. At Oldham, you were very keen to play your own rather than necessarily loaning in youngsters of other clubs and playing them. This then creates um, a sense of purpose through the young players in that in that youth team that they feel they've got a chance of making it in the first team. It also creates potential assets for the club to sell on in the future. Um, and it, sends a, it creates a sense of pride among the fan base about seeing their young players get opportunities at their club. I mean, what is your thoughts on how you're going to bring that side of the game that you've learned, that you've taught at, into Barrow? Because it is quite difficult um, in the modern football era for low league clubs to get youngsters and bring them through to first team football. Because often, as I speak to the Tranmere owners recently, they get pinched bef by other clubs um, before they get to a stage where they're ready for first team football. Well, you look at what we did at Halifax, um, you, you look at players who, who were maybe in 23s football who, who had lost their way, or lads just in general that lost their way. And I think, well, you, there's eight lads left Halifax this summer who, before they came in, weren't really going anywhere. And before we came in, not to us, we're not going anywhere. And you look at Jay Ben as an example, who's just been sold to Lincoln from Halifax, who was a U team product. Nothing would give me greater pleasure than producing one of our own, at least one of our own. And moving them on at, at Barrow. Now we are working tirelessly to get the academy right at Barrow. It's not up and running yet, but in the next 12 months, I would like to say that we've got that academy up and running and then that gives us a base to try and produce one of our own. I, I always said when I came into first team football, when I wasn't in first team football, I used to get frustrated with managers who wouldn't give you the chance. So when I came in, I had to live it. And at every football club I've been at, I've made sure that we've given young players a chance. Young players never let you down never let you down when you give them a chance yes they'll make mistakes but there are there are our own players so they'll make mistakes it's only it's only like bringing a loan in from another club and then making a mistake so we'd rather our own make a mistake than somebody else's making a mistake so we're really committed to getting young players from barrow we've got to be good enough don't get me wrong but, but moving them through and i think i'd like to think over the two previous clubs i've been at i've got history of giving youth a chance, making them better and moving them on and making them football and financial assets for the football club. And Brett Halifax are currently reaping the rewards of what we've done there. And, and there's a cattle market going on there, which I'm sure the new manager is not happy about because everybody wants the players. But that's football. You're giving young players a chance and giving young players a chance to thrive is something I get the biggest dig out of. Yes, winning football matches is great. The, the, the biggest thing I get out of football is seeing young players progress and then they sat at a game six months down the line and thinking, oh, we had him. I wonder how he does tonight. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of, a lot of fans love seeing their, their players move on and, and do well. I'm, I'm an Oxford United fan. And less so our own players these days, but often players that we've recruited from other teams and then developed further and sold on. That's been a business model which Although it's difficult as a fan seeing some of your favourite players leave, you understand as a as a supporter of that club financially why they have to do it. So, yeah, it's it's something that I think everyone would understand at Barrow and hope to see. What, what's your thoughts, though, on the way the academies work? I think Barrow's geographic location could give them quite an advantage. It's, it's not exactly in the midst. There's not a huge number of clubs necessarily very close, though not far down the road, you could argue, there are some big academy clubs. Um, do you do you think bringing young players through from a very young age and trying to get them into the first team is better or do you think that what some of these other clubs are now doing is getting the players that have been maybe lost their way in under 23s football and and bringing them in and giving them a chance is is a is a better way of doing it or combining both perhaps i think both models the, the, there's merits in both models um having come through at oldham we always gave them a chance don't get me wrong, we sold quite a few of them before they even got anywhere near the first team and the age of being near the first team. But that that finance the football club, generally in football clubs, the only team that makes me is the academy because they sell money that then goes back into the football club that keeps the football club going. So uh, the academy model works if you if you know that you're probably going to lose them and it's going to keep, finance, keep financing itself and, and that works for many a year at Oldham. But I also know that the other model works in then waiting for the weight and strays to come out of these football clubs at, at 15, 16, and then picking them up and, and developing them and getting them back on the road. I think both work, but I think the key is, is 
is who's leading the ship, whether that be the director of football or the manager, a, a commitment to playing the young players because there's enough managers out there that, that will say, well, I'm not in the job long enough to develop kids. I'm here to win football manage, ma matches in the short term, uh, sustain my job, retain my job and, and push on. But I think there's a, I, I've seen in the last five years, there's a change of guard, so, so to speak, where a lot more football clubs giving coaches who are time served on the grass a chance and a chance to uh, coach and develop and make players better. So maybe bringing in players who are not the finished article and, and coaching them and making them better on the grass and and then be patient for them to become the, the finished article. And I think in the recruitment of managers, so head coaches over the last two to three years, I think we've seen a massive change in that where there's not many, some of these clubs haven't got the, the budgets to lift at the top end. So what they've had to do is getting coaches who can make players better. And so I think the long-winded answer is there. There's a bit of both, but unless the person driving it at the top gives them a the chance, it doesn't matter what model you got. No, I agree. Uh, absolutely. Um, you come from a non-playing background into football uh, and then you're you're now first team manager of a, an EFL club. I mean, does the fact that you weren't a player make you appreciate more the position you now have, do you think? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I've done some random jobs across my career and been in some random situations, but I always knew that I'd get a chance. I never thought I'd get a chance at 34, don't get me wrong, but I always knew I'd get a chance and it, it, Gary Player's profound statement the, that the harder you work, the luckier you get, I, certainly rings true with me. Um, cut trees down for a living as an apprentice mechanic, as a land, landlord, I did, I did a bit of everything, but I, I always laugh with my friends that I always say, listen, when all this is over, I'll just go back and get a proper job because I've been in that world. So I, I, I'll live this dream as long as it lasts, but I, I know the reality is that I'm humble enough to go back and get a so-called proper job when it when it all comes to an end at whatever point in my career and in my life that does. So that that that's fine with me. And and like I say, I live every day and I come in with a smile on my face because I know I'm very privileged to work in the industry I work in. Um, and and with the the pressure pressure is a privilege, and I kind of I love the pressure because it, it's what drives me every morning to be better. And I think. When the pressure gets too much to you, then, then then that's maybe the time where you end up losing your job. So I just take pressure as a privilege and enjoy every day while I'm in it. Absolutely. Well, when you're 50 and you're the England manager, I'll uh, I'll come back to you on this interview. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sure you'll make it there. Uh, you know your win percentage is 46.79%, yeah. which is phenomenal, which is phenomenal. So, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll I mean, you were, your name was linked with loads of clubs. Were, were any other big clubs close to getting you? I mean, we had the Grimsby's of this world. We had uh, Bradford. We had loads of teams linked to Pete Wild. Were any close to, to sort of getting you out of Halifax before eventually you went? Well, the thing that annoys me is because losing to Chesterfield dropped it below 47%. That really annoyed me. <laughs> but apart from that, um, listen, there's been, I've been really, really lucky. Over the last three years, probably the last 12 months, it's the phone's been yeah there's been some wow offers there's been some offers where i thought oh my god but i didn't as a young i've got a young family and i really didn't want to move away from the young family if i'm honest with you um i'm really enjoying watching my son grow up and really enjoying family life at the moment and i, I didn't really want that to to end so i was really calculated in, in what i did and i wanted to finish off what had happened at halifax they were they gave me a chance when nobody else did so I wanted to really just make sure that was finished off properly um, and then sort of really assess what I was doing in the summer. And yes, there was, you could say, bigger clubs offers across the last 12 months. Well, there was, but this one just felt right. And this one just excited me, excited, that word, but excited me the most. So um, this is why I took this one. And again, there is the, the thought process in your mind that you could make too big of a step and then have a massive fall from grace where I see this one as an incremental step in my career, gets me back in the league, gets me back in League Two and understanding League Two. And and hopefully me and Barrow can go on a journey together having made like what I call an incremental step. Well, absolutely. I mean, recently we have seen clubs like Morecambe, Cambridge, 
uh, Cheltenham. They, they, you know, no, you could argue Barrow is a similar size club to those. They're all in League One now. Accrington, of course, is the is the model that everyone looks at. So there's no reason why, with good recruitment and a good philosophy on the pitch, that you can't go far. Um, you know, and that all requires good structures as well behind the scenes, which, you, like you said, Barrow now have put in place. So, um, before we go, I have to ask you that that game at Fulham against a Premier never goes League away this, never goes away. This conversation. <laughs> well, a Premier League winning manager um, in Claudio Ranieri is that still, despite all you've done in football now, the, the sort of the highlight of your career, would you say? Oh, 100%. 100%. That was the first week in management. I just I thought management was just like that every week. <laughs> was that like your third game, wasn't it? <laughs> this third game, I'd had two. I've been in football management a week. I'd had two league games we'd luckily won. Can't they follow them? And at the end of the first week, I'm sat on match of the day. You, well, you don't get better than that, does it? I mean, if, if football had ended at that point, I'd have been happy and had a story in the pub to tell for 40 years to come. So, um, yeah, what what a day, what what an occasion. I think it made it more special because it was my 40 club and out of the 4,000 fans there, I probably knew 1,500 of them personally. So, yeah, what what a day, what a, what, what a day for the town, not just for me and my family, but what a day for the town. Oldham haven't had many days like that in, in the past 10, 15 years. So, for everybody to have that day and for the young Oldham fans to get get that day in the sun that probably they've never had before. You can't ask for better than that, can you really? Was there any questions you asked Ranieri when you sat down with the ah, post-match? The, the one story I always tell is that, do you know when, when you've had enough of somebody and you fidget because you want to get rid of them? He didn't move an inch for half an hour. He gave me his full attention for a good half an hour and I'm sat there with a glass of red wine and anybody knows me for old and me having a glass of red wine is just like, what are you doing? You don't drink red wine. But I thought that I'm never going to get this opportunity again. And he didn't move an inch. He you know, had question after question after question. And he was, he was unbelievable. It just shows the measure of the man, the quality of the man where he gives us just some kid out of old and half an hour of his time sat in his office drinking his red wine. He give him... After being beat by him as well. Yeah, being beat by him as well. He must have wanted to go home and kick the cat and, and be like, just sit there and go. Arr! But he, he was brilliant. He was brilliant with men and, and fair play to him. What's it feel like to be the fact that you are now part of FA Cup history? I mean, as a kid, you see, you know, FA Cup used to be massive and you used to see the sort of the the BBC reel out all the all the footage at the start of the season when the FA Cup was kicking off of managers running on the pitch celebrating. Your your celebration is going to be part of FA Cup history forevermore. I mean, how, how does that compute with your mind? It must be amazing. I, I love the FA Cup; it's fantastic. And what a, what a competition! Um, until last year, I had since Fulham, I'd never won a game in the FA Cup. So I think I'd gone about six games in the FA Cup after Fulham and never won one. So I was like, I thought there was a hoodoo on me after this game. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, it's quality in it. What what a competition and. And yeah, for for an excited fan when we score the winner, didn't do, they didn't do yourself too bad. I think that's that's probably a selling point for the next twenty years. That's that's got me got me a gig in management. So I'll take that. Absolutely. And uh, finally, let's finish up with the all important question: uh, red sauce, brown sauce, or no sauce? Brown sauce nailed on. Yeah, it's called the brown sauce, but, which is funny because if we ever have a, have a bacon butt in our house, my missus makes me put my own brown sauce on because she just can't stand it that bad. But she, has to, she makes me put it on myself. So that's that's how the hatred of brown sauce in our house, but I love it. I'm glad you didn't say no sauce because uh, that's the incorrect answer. <laughs> Northerners have sauce with everything. There's a sauce with everything in a northern. Yeah, no, there's uh, that famous joke that down south, we, we don't have anything moist in our food. Yeah, it's, correct. It's, correct. It's dry down here. Yeah, that's right. Pete, um, I know you're a busy man, so thank you very much for giving me your time this morning. Um, and good luck, not just this season, but in the rest of your career. We'll be watching closely and uh, obviously we'll be supporting you when you do finally get uh, to manage the England national team, which will be sooner than you, I'm sure you think. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Thanks for having me on. Nice one. And thank you for our listeners and our patrons as well. Much appreciated. As always, you can follow us on Twitter at D3D4Football. And we'll be back soon with another podcast. Until then, everyone, take care and goodbye.